I like to use objects when, when I preach and when I teach. So we're talking this morning about three lost things. And this is from Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Chapter 15. Three lost things. This morning we're going to talk again about the sheep and the coins. What's the third lost thing? The sun. We won't get to that this morning, but we are going in that direction. Those of you that say, yes, but Pastor Dunford, you spoke about that last week. Bear with me, and we'll, we'll keep on going together this morning. Um, so we're going to talk about three lost things this morning. We'll talk about the first two, the sheep and the coin. But I want to start in a slightly different way this morning. I want to ask you something. Have you ever been accused of something that would be considered bad? Have you, ever, have you ever been accused, rightfully or wrong, or rightly or wrongly, have you ever been accused of something, you did this, or you said this? Have you ever been accused? I've been accused before. All of us have been, and that's part of life. As we come to this passage this morning, in Luke 15, I want us to come from this perspective. This story begins because Jesus was accused of something. And we look at Luke 15, 1 and 2. Um, when you're accused of something, how upset do you get? Do you get pretty upset? Do you defend yourself? I always want to defend myself as well, um, especially when we're wrongly accused. But let me ask you something. Even when we're rightly accused, we still sometimes want to defend ourselves, don't we? Yes, but you, you know, we, we, all, we try to have a justification. But let's look at Luke 15, 1 and 2, and this is from the New King James, and this is what we read. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to, to him to hear him. Now notice that verse 1 begins with, then all of them drew near to him to hear him. To hear him. Do you know why they drew near to Jesus? He never had or has or will there ever be a man as holy and as righteous as Jesus. Never, never. I mean, think of all the good people that you know. Think of all the holy people that you know, or the righteous people you know. None of them, none of them compare to Jesus. None of them. And yet, this chapter says, here's this holy, holy person, completely righteous, no fault at all, and who comes near to him to hear him? The sinners and the tax collectors. For the Jews, the tax collectors were the lowest of the low. Let me ask you something. In your culture, in your society, we're from several different cultural backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds here. What type of person would you consider the lowest of the low? The worst of the worst? We could imagine some things, couldn't we? I, I, I have several things that come to mind. For me, I would probably say, um, some of you might say a drug dealer, perhaps. Someone might say well, a prostitute. Um, someone might say a rapist. Someone might say a pedophile. I'd probably say, in my thinking, I'd probably say a pedophile. We think of these things, or, or a, a sexual predator in some way, or that, those are, for me, those are things that come to mind. So here, are, for the Jewish culture, the worst would be tax collectors. Why? Because they were Jewish and they had betrayed their own people by joining with the Romans to collect taxes and to collect taxes unfairly. So they're the lowest of the low, the worst of the worst in Jewish eyes. And this chapter begins by saying these worst of the worst, if you will, came near to the best of the best to hear him. They wanted to hear him. I wonder what Jesus was saying. I wonder what Jesus was showing. Well, we know it wasn't condemnation because nobody wants to be around condemnation, do they? When somebody condemns you, do you like to be around that person? No. 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 And so the people, these worst of the worst, drew near the best of the best to hear him. And if you read the chapter, you'll see that what Jesus does is he loves them. He doesn't, he doesn't think lightly of their sin. He doesn't say, oh, it doesn't matter because it does matter. But what he does first is he shows love to them. And there's an open door. And because there's an open door, the worst of the worst 
come close to the best of the best. And then we hear the accusations. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, this is verse 2, saying, here's the accusation, this man, actually in other translations, you know what the other translations are worse. Do you know what some of the other translations say? This is about Jesus. Do you know what they say? This fellow, this is Jesus, the Son of God, God himself. And they're saying, this fellow, he receives sinners and he eats with them. It's bad enough that he will even listen to them and let them come near, but he even spends time with them. He eats with them. And for them, for them, that meant you're identifying. But the best of the best came for the worst of the worst and everybody in between. And so as the scribes and the Pharisees made this accusation, the accusation was true. The accusation was right. But instead of being an accusation for Jesus, it was a vindication and it's a reminder that this was why he had come. This was why he had come. And as Jesus looked at them, then he began to tell this story to all of those who said, I'm not a sinner and I'm not a tax collector. And this is the context for the story. And we talked a little bit about these three stories or these three parables that we talked about last time. Instead of defending them directly, Jesus defends himself and he makes a point indirectly and he starts with three stories. The first is the sheep that's lost, the second is the coin, and the third that is, is the son that's lost. So let's look between, let's look again at Luke 15, 4 through 7 again, um, as we did last week. And as we said, this was a story that the men and the boys would understand very, very well. This wasn't really a story for the girls. Young girls at that time never said, when I grow up, I want to be a shepherd. That wasn't what little girls said. Little boys might have said that, but it was a story for the men and the boys. And then the second story was a story for the girls and for the women. And it's a story of the lost sheep. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? What will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. How many of you would like to carry home a sheep on your shoulders? They're stanky. <laughs> they are. Sheep are, sheep are not are smelly little things, smelly big things. But that was very common. The shepherd would take the sheep. Who knows, maybe the sheep was injured, or maybe it was very tired, and maybe it, had, maybe it had roamed a long way. And he would take the sheep, and he would drape it around his shoulders with the, with the four legs in the front, and hold the legs like that, and then he would take the sheep back. That's how they did it. That's how they did it. And because it was his sheep, and it had been lost, the shepherd didn't mind that it was dirty. The shepherd didn't mind that it was smelly. It was his sheep and it had been lost, but he had found it. And so when he has found it, verse 5, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And I love that word, and we'll talk about that word a little bit more later this morning as we come to the end. It says, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. You know, I think so often we miss that, don't we? Uh, when somebody repents or when somebody's done wrong and then they make it right again, what do we so often do? We just scold them all the way, don't we? Well, you were really bad. We do, don't we? You blah, 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 blah. And we take it as an opportunity to, to really wag our fingers at them. And it's true. It's true. And I say that because that's the way I am sometimes as well. That's true. We wag our fingers and we take the opportunity to, to remind them of all their wrongs and all their sins. Oh, God help us to learn something from this story. Because what does it say? He joyfully carries it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and who haven't strayed away. And we talked about this last Sunday. Um, 100 sheep is the size of an average herd. This shepherd would be neither rich nor poor. And maybe in your culture, a hundred sheep makes you rich, right? If you have a hundred sheep, not in that culture. A hundred sheep was, the, was, the, was an average size for a herd. And this picture that we see here 
as we look at this, I want us just to think about this a little bit more. And I want us to think about why the shepherd would leave the 99 for the one. Because he has 99. If there's one missing, if you're a businessman, that's a 1% loss. I'm not a businessman. That's a 1% loss. Those of you that are business people, isn't that pretty good? 1% loss? That's pretty good, isn't it? Chris? Not bad. Not bad, thank you. <laughs> Chris owns his own business. You know. Not bad. Why not just cut your losses? Think about the effort that would go, he would have to go in to take to find the sheep. Think about the work. Think about the time. Think about leaving the other 99. Think about the cost when he finds the sheep and then comes back and didn't think about this last week, did, did we? Think about the cost for a party for the sheep. By the way, the shepherd would not really have a party for the sheep, okay? <laughs> there wouldn't be a lost sheep party. They wouldn't have done that, but that's not the point of the parable. Jesus is trying to make another point about the parable. But I do want you to think about that for just a minute. 99 sheep he has, only one sheep is lost. As I was preparing yesterday, I was reminded of something about my mother. As we think about this, why would the shepherd go for the one sheep when he has 99? And I was thinking about my mom, who, when her eyesight was better, and some of you don't know my mom, some of you know her very well, but here's something that I can tell you about my mother. When my mother's eyesight was better, her favorite activity when she had free time was to put together jigsaw puzzles. Mom loved it. Here in Hong Kong, she had a whole, the whole top shelf with one cupboard. It was just jigsaw puzzle after jigsaw puzzle. She had about 20 of them. And she had small ones and large ones, but her favorite ones were the big ones. You know, sometimes we get really excited when we put together a 300-piece jigsaw puzzle. Mom didn't even bother with 300 pieces. She got excited when they were 750 or 1,000 pieces. She loved it. And every once in a while, she got 1,500 pieces. And she loved it. And she put it together. This was something her mother did. My grandmother also did as well. I think it's an Amish thing. I don't know. It's a simple, it's a simple pleasure. And she would put it together. And she would take days. And she would sit there and she would look and then when she had to cook dinner, she would put it aside, then she'd start cooking dinner and then in the evening she would go back and she would do it again and she would put it all together. And the greatest joy came when? When she reached the end. And she would have all the pieces and there would be three or four pieces left and she would, she always had a pattern for doing it. And then she would put the last piece in. And ah, the pleasure she would feel as the last piece Let's say it was 1,000 pieces. 999 pieces, and then the 1,000th piece would be put in. And she would look at it, and she would be so happy with it. And really, about 30 minutes later, she'd take it all apart and, and put it back. Like she did. And she'd put it up in, she'd put it up in, her, in her cabinet, and maybe three years later, she'd bring it out again, and then she'd do it again. But every once in a while, other people would give her puzzles, and maybe they were used puzzles. And just as there was no greater joy than putting the 1,000th piece into the puzzle, there was nothing worse in mom's eyes. You know what's coming next, right? You know it. Then coming to the end of the puzzle, ready for the last piece, and it was missing. Somebody, one, and you know, how many of you have seen missing puzzle pieces here and there? And those of you say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's just one piece. There are so many other pieces. For a jigsaw puzzle person, it matters. It matters. It really does. Now, this is just an earthly example and a very simple example. But I want us to think about that as we, as we look at that. And for me, anyhow, because my mom does jigsaw puzzles, it helped me to understand this a little bit better. You know, I'm a pastor. I look at this and think, oh, yes, yes, yes. I understand the spiritual part about it. But I think because it's a parable, sometimes we think about earthly examples, it helps us to understand it better. And the disappointment when a part is missing, when something that should be there is not there, because it belongs together. It's part of the world. And here we understand, in an earthly example, 
only a little bit of the joy of the Father when someone who is his, who belongs to him, but has been lost through sin, who has been lost through rebellion, who has been lost through deception, who has been lost through carelessness, who has been lost through disappointment or hurt feelings at times, who has been lost through inattention, is found and is brought back in. And there is, in the natural, there's the feeling of it's complete. This is as it should be. How much more, how much more is the joy of the Father and the love of the Father overflowing when what was missing is brought back to where it belongs? Now think just for a minute with me about the party that the shepherd has. I told you that shepherds don't have parties for lost sheep, okay? But that's not the way Jesus tells the story. Jesus tells the story with a party at the end. In fact, all three of these stories have parties at the end. Now, I think the only situation where there really was, would be a party is with the last one, with the lost son. Then there was a party. And we'll talk about that the next time we come back to this. But I want you to think with me, because there's a party at the end of this one, and there's a party when a woman finds her lost coin as well. Now, to have a party, he calls together his friends and neighbors, and he says, rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. And I want you to think about that for just a minute. Because if there's going to be a party, let me ask you, what kind of party would it be if I said, hey, Christy, come, rejoice with me. Sister Ampi, come rejoice with me. Palmer, come rejoice. And we all get together, and we stand there, and we say, now rejoice, my sheep is back. What kind of party is that? Not much. A party should have food, yes. music, drinks. There would be expense for a party. And frankly, in those days, if there was that type of party, they probably would have slaughtered a goat or a calf or maybe even a sheep. Although usually sheep, sorry, not, not the sheep that was lost. <laughs> that would be too bad. <laughs> That's, what, that's right. That's what you deserve. Right? And honestly, and I'm so glad you said that because we sometimes think that way, don't we? You deserve it. You wandered off. Foolish sheep. You were careless. You didn't pay attention to the voice of the shepherd. You wandered off. And honestly, brothers and sisters, our hearts are pretty hard at times, aren't they? When we think about Christians who have strayed or when we think about people who have never known the Lord who are in tough situations. But that's not the heart of the Father. It's not the heart of the Father. And Lord, help me and Lord, help you as well to have a change of heart as we look at the heart of the Father. Because the heart of the Father had no condemnation. The heart of the Father had no, it's what you deserve. The heart of the Father was joyful. He says joyfully here. And then he says here, rejoice. And here, joy again. And we see this picture, and the heart of the Father rejoices. That party would have cost, listen, that party would have cost far more than the sheep was worth. It would have cost far more than the sheep was worth. Why was there a party? Why was there a party? Because the shepherd loved the sheep and because your heavenly father values you your life who you are he values you more than you know he values people more than they realize we look at people and at a good person we would say oh this person is valuable this person contributes to society. This person is a good church member. They're faithful. They're loyal. They're here every Sunday. They tithe. They read their Bibles. They this and they that. But others, maybe they're not worth so much. Or those that are far from the Lord. Somebody who's really bad, if you will. Somebody who's a drug dealer. 
or who's a prostitute or a pimp or, or whatever, any one of these things, who's done terrible and horrible things, somebody who has wasted his life or wasted her life, we look and our value very often for that type of person is low, isn't it? It's not very high. It's a low, it's a low value. Of all of the sheep in that, in that shepherd's flock, of all of the sheep in the shepherd, shepherd's flock, which sheep should have had the lowest value? The disobedient sheep, the careless sheep, the sheep that wandered off, the sheep that got lost, the sheep that didn't listen to his voice, for whatever reason, the lost sheep. And the picture that we have here is instead of a sheep that is of little or no value, in the eyes of the shepherd, it is worth it for the cost. It is worth it to pay the price. It is worth it for the effort. Why? Because the sheep is valuable to me. Because the sheep is my sheep. Because the sheep belongs in my flock. And it's mine. And if it's lost, I will do anything to get it back. And when it is found, I will be extravagant in my joy. I will be extravagant in my celebration. Why? Because the sheep is worth something to the, to the shepherd. And because people are worth something to God. You are worth something to God. Some of you this morning come from families and homes where your parents and your family members have praised you, have loved you, have honored you, have built you up, and they've let you know how much I love you and how, how valuable you are and you're a person of worth. Others of you this morning, others of you this morning have been brought up in families where you were not loved, or you were loved very little, or where you were compared to somebody else in the family. If you were a girl, maybe you were compared to a son in the family. And in many cultures, sons would be highly praised and daughters wouldn't be very praised at all. Or maybe you were not as smart as a sister or as a brother. And you were told you're not worth very much. You're not very valuable. I remember Pastor Renee would know as well. Many years ago, we were counseling someone. Um, no, it's not somebody who's here. And the person was struggling because as a child, as a child, her mother, the one who should have built her up, the mother told her, you are ugly. No one will ever love you. I, I can't even... I can't even understand someone that would say that. I can't understand a mother that would say that to a child. But maybe that's what the mother had heard herself when she was a child. And that woman grew up believing and hearing, I'm not very valuable. I am unlovable. I'm not worth very much. Brothers and sisters, what I want to say to you this morning is this. Now here's a picture about the lost sheep and the found sheep. But it goes beyond that. Part of the point of this story is that the sheep is valuable to the shepherd and a person is valuable to God. Are you the best sheep in the flock? You may not be, according to other people. Are you the smartest sheep in the flock? You may not be, according to other people. But it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter how other people value. It, it, it matters in that it touches our hearts and, and it touches our lives. But the point is this. What you need to know this morning and what you have to hold on to this morning is this. You are valuable to God. You are worth it to God. You matter to God. If you are lost, it matters to God. If you wander away, it matters to God. If you are hurt, it matters to God. If you are afraid, it matters to God. If you don't have enough, it matters to God. It matters to God. You are valuable to Him. And to me, that is part. Is this the main point of the parable? It's not the main point. The main point is about a love of, the love of the Father for the sheep. But this is one of the points, and this is part of it as well. And he throws a party when the sheep is found. He spends more than the sheep is worth. So brothers and sisters, this morning, receive this word from the Lord. 
God paid the price of Jesus for you. You are worth more than you know. You are worth more than you think. You are worth more than you have been told by people who have the wrong idea of you. You are valuable to God. And he rejoices when you are found. He rejoices. I want to give you another example now. I told you this was part of my story. Not the coins, because the coins are mixed. But this is part of this story. I want to show you something in this bag. Lighthouse has a lost and found. Did you know that? It's up on the fourth floor. I want to show you some things. I, this is not made up. This is truly lost and found. Does this any, belong to anybody? It's been there for months. Isn't that right, Ida? I think months. Months. We're on here? <laughs> this thing has been up there for a year. <laughs> it sort of looks like it, doesn't it? <laughs> and by the way, the next time we have a yard sale, this is going to be in the yard sale. <laughs> Unless somebody claims it. Do you know that I do that all along with pieces of clothing? It goes into the yard sale if it stays up there a long time. But this is in the lost and found. This has been up there for a year. Even more troubling. Oh. A Bible. That should not be. Munda ka. It's a French Bible. <laughs> but don't worry, it's been there. More troubling, this Bible has been back there for several years. And we lose Bibles all along. So I want to ask you something. As we talk about lost sheep and lost things. Why are these things still lost? Nobody has called me on Sunday night in a panic saying, Pastor Jennifer, I left my water bottle at church. Please, will you go back to the church and open it up so I can get my water bottle? I must have my water bottle. Nobody said, my Bible, I've got to get my Bible. I've never received any phone calls about any of these items. Why are these items still lost? Really? You know, I told you, I'm, I'm pretty practical when I preach. Why are these items still lost in the lost and found, and they've been there? This is the most recent one. This is the old one, and this is the oldest. Why are they still lost? Think about it. Why? Why? Nobody cares. Okay. Anybody else? It doesn't matter? They don't. Oh, you mean they might have 99 other Bibles. <laughs> Some people do. They might have 99 others. Or they don't really care, right? Or, oh, well, I lost it, but I don't know where I lost it. These things are not valuable to them, are they? Because if they were valuable, the owners would have looked for them and found them. The owners would have looked and found them. And when, as I was thinking about this yesterday, because there's always a lost and found up at Lighthouse, and sometimes we forget where we leave things, and I understand that. I'm not, I hope nobody feels guilty. Um, if, this is, if this is your thing, you can come up and get it after the second service. But I have to use this in the second service as well. So wait until after the second service. But I was thinking about these things. Are these things big things? Yeah. Not particularly big. They're small things, and maybe they have other ones. But they belong to somebody, don't they? Yes. But they are unimportant, apparently, to the owners of these things. Or it didn't really matter. Or I can easily replace it. And I thought, Lord, thank you. As I was thinking about the story of the 99 sheep and the one that's lost, God does not treat us that way, and he doesn't look at us that way. There were 99 other sheep. It does not matter to God that there are 99 other sheep if you are the one lost sheep. You matter to God. You're valuable to God. You won't be left. You won't be forgotten. 
you won't be replaced. Oh, they could just go out. I should have gotten an umbrella because you know there are a, <laughs> 30 umbrellas floating in and out of Lighthouse at various times. It's easy to replace, but not the lost sheep because the sheep is valuable to the owner. And then we turn to the lost coin. We talked about this last week. That's in the next passage. The lost coin is the story for the women and for the girls because that was part of the dowry. It would have been one of ten coins. And she loses it. It's in a house. It's dark in the house. There would have been maybe one window or no windows in the house. The floor would have been cobblestones with dirt in between, or it would have been just a dirt floor, and the coin would have dropped. What does she do? What does she do? It says she lights a lamp, first of all. She sweeps the house. She sweeps the entire house. And she searches carefully. She does everything that she has to do until she finds it. It would have been the equivalent, I don't have a wedding ring, as you know, but it would have been the equivalent of a wedding ring for her. Some wedding rings are worth a lot. Some wedding rings have diamonds on them. Some wedding rings are gold bands. Some wedding rings are very simple silver bands, aren't they? It, dep it, it depends. For this woman, it would have been one of ten silver coins. But what does she do? She looks until she finds it. The, the word for this coin that's missing is a drachma. A drachma, D-R-A-C-H-M-A. And that was a silver coin. And as I was looking more this week about how much it cost, um, it certainly would have had sentimental value, but it had other value as well. And as I looked it up, this is what I found. It is worth about 20 cents. And this was the ordinary wage for one day, for a day worker. If you hire somebody for the day to work in the field, it would make 20 cents. So for this woman, it was one-tenth of her dowry, one-tenth of her saving. And she searches till she finds it. Other people said that it was enough money, other commentators said that it was enough money to buy a whole oxen, which seems like a lot to me. Others say it's 20 cents. Others say it's a, the labor of a day. And as I was thinking about that, I began to think further, why was there a difference in what it's worth? Why is there a difference in the seeming value? Because it depends on different things for different people, doesn't it? It depends on, on what it means to the person. So I want to ask you something. I threw some coins. Sorry, Brother Roy, you're going to have to follow me around. Okay. I've got some money here. And over here is, down there and there, there's a $1 coin, $1 Hong Kong coin, okay? How many of you on the street, if you saw that $1 coin, you bend over and you pick it up? Okay, okay, let me turn it around. Let me turn it around. How many of you, if you saw a $1 coin on the street, and this is not judgment, Okay. There's no, there's no, you're not judging anything. How many of you with a $1 coin, you would not pick it up? Anybody? Really? <laughs> okay. So, some of you would, some of you would not pick up the dollar. Okay? It's pretty good. That's why I have hand sanitizer. Okay. Okay, Pastor Renee, but here is a $2 coin. Would you pick up a $2 coin? <laughs> How many of you would not pick up a two dollar coin? <laughs> Kenneth doesn't like journals. I'm a player of handwriting. He's afraid of the camera. Somebody has lost money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who else would not pick up a two dollar coin? Anybody else? Tension? Why not? Same reason. You're afraid of cameras. Though. Okay, so, so fear of cameras outweighs. Okay. How many of you would pick it up? A two dollar coin. Oh, okay. more people. Okay. Ah. Oh, oh, here's a ten dollar. I didn't even ask you. There was a ten dollar coin. Would anybody not pick up a ten dollar coin? Well, like Tin Shin and Ken. Okay. And Heidi, are you afraid of cameras? No, it doesn't belong to me. Why would I pick it up? 
lost it. It had sentimental value, it had other value. When I was a senior in high school, after I graduated from high school, I worked in, uh, at the youth camp for Alabama, um, the summer youth camp. All the kids from all over the state would come there, and I worked one summer. And it was after I had graduated, and in the U.S. at that time, I'm sorry, I don't know about Germany or Mexico or France or Philippines, but when we graduated from high school, we would, uh, many people would order a high school class ring. Do, do, do they still do that? Yes. Some still do that. I ordered a high school class ring. Now we were really poor, right? We were really, I mean, we're coming to a close now. We were really poor, so my high school class ring was not made of gold or silver, as many others was. Mine was one of those other metals. I don't know what it was. And it wasn't worth a lot, but it had the year I graduated, it had the name of my high school, and on the inside it had my name. And at camp, I lost the ring. I was in my room, I was throwing things away, I lost the ring, and I was horrified. Was it worth a lot? Not to somebody else, but it was worth it to me. And I looked everywhere, and I couldn't find it. I looked under the bed, I looked everywhere, I couldn't find it anywhere. And late that night, I thought, what if I threw it away? I think I threw it away. And I knew that the only place I could find it was in the huge garbage dump out by the road. This is at a summer camp with all the food for lunch and dinner in there, with all of the cartons of milk soured in the sun. It was in it. And I thought to myself, it's going to be dirty. It's going to be smelly. It's going to be terrible. But it's my ring, and it's valuable to me, and I want it. And I went out in the dark, 11 o'clock at night with the flashlight, down the dirt road, jumped into that huge garbage bin, and I, I started to, maybe I wouldn't do it now. <laughs> but at age 18, I was willing to do it. It was valuable to me. And I dug through, and I dug, and I dug, and I dug, until halfway down, Ring. And I should have brought it this morning. I should have brought it this morning, and I have it still. I don't wear it anymore, but I have it still. And I washed it. <laughs> and I never lost it again. Well, we come to a close, and it's come, we come to a close. But I want you to think about this as we come to a close this morning, and your value to the Lord. That woman was willing to get down on her hands and knees to sweep the dirt and to light a light, to find that coin in a dirty place. I was willing to jump into a dirty, smelly garbage bin to find that ring that belonged to me. And the King of Heaven, Jesus, was willing to leave heaven in the beauty and the glory of heaven and to come down to a dirty, smelly, broken world to find his lost coin, to find you 
to find you. You are valid to him. And he will search for you until he finds you. He came to what was broken and dirty and smelly, but he was willing to do it because of your value to him. Let's close the prayer. Lord, it's hard for us to understand how you could value us so highly. It really is. How you could care so much about us, how you could love us so much, how you could be so valuable to us. Lord, the devil didn't want us. He just wanted to destroy God's handiwork, to destroy your handiwork. And he got us because we sinned and because we rebelled. But he doesn't want us and he doesn't love us. And yet when we were lost, you loved us and you valued us enough that you are willing to pay a far greater price than what it seems we are worth. That you are willing and you are willing to come to a place that was so far below heaven, a broken world where you would suffer so that you could find your lost coin, so that you could retrieve a lost sheep. Lord, I pray that this would be strong in our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we look at ourselves and that as we look at others, we would see what you see, that, you are, that we are valuable to you. That others, though they are broken and marred and messed up and rebellious and stubborn and sinful, just like us, that they are valuable to you and you're willing to pay a price. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the price that you paid. May we have the heart that you have for others who are lost. May we be willing to search till they are found. And may we hold in our hearts your love and your value of us. And may we live and walk and believe 